Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being with us on this Thursday, Friday Eve, um, taking this hour out of your lunch break to come in and chat with us for this In Touch Mentor Series. Um, so we're super excited to have you all. Um, this series will be presented and facilitated by industry leaders, CEOs, experts, and our sponsor for a good cause partners, who I'm sure you all know and love. Here on our InTouch platform, we're committed to diversity and inclusion in our mentor series lineup. So if you know of anyone that would like to sign up and be part of this mentorship program, you can sign up at www.ommktg.com or you can email Maddie and myself. I'm Annalise, by the way, I didn't introduce myself. I always do that all the time. I'm Annalise, I'm the CIA a marketing director and I'm also the national ambassador for InTouch. So if you guys have any questions, or would like to sign up for this mentor series, feel free to reach out to Mari or myself. Um, so for today's episode, we have two speakers who you all know, uh, Claire Musselman and Katie Hensley. Um, so welcome ladies, it's a pleasure to have you. We're excited for this talk. Um, some things that I kind of want to go over before we get started. This is a conversational series, so we want everybody to engage. Do not be shy, you know, Claire and Katie are expecting questions from you guys. Don't wanna put pressure, but they are. Um, so they definitely want you guys to engage. Um, put any questions in the chat. You can put your hand up if you wanna do it live and just speak, that's fine too. Um, so please, please don't be shy, engage with us. We do have questions for the group too that we really want you guys to participate on, so. So rules are gonna be slim. <laughs> So today we will be discussing the history of workers' compensation, but before we get started, I would obviously like to introduce our speakers for this afternoon. So as I mentioned, one of our speakers is Katie Hensley. Katie began her insurance career 10 years ago, handling workers' compensation claims across multiple jurisdictions and industries. Katie helped grow and lead the Cunningham and Butler Risk Management Claims and Safety Advocacy Team. Today, Katie is a well-respected and experienced risk management advisor with a strong background in claims, safety management, and advocacy. Katie is most proud of being a mom to her silly and smart seven-year-old son, Toby. So hi, Katie. I lost her. She's somewhere. Hello, hello. I'm here. I'm here. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Very excited, everyone. Thank you for being here. So we'll go, our next speaker is the Director of Workers' Compensation and founder of the first ever Workers' Recovery Unit. Using her knowledge with over 16 years of direct claims experience, Claire Musselman has designed a new approach to workers' compensation. Claire built the Workers' Recovery Unit by combining a solid technical foundation with her passion for creating a better experience overall. Claire now speaks nationally on the topic of humanity and claims, looking to change the industry one professional at a time. She co-hosts Adjusted, a claims podcast sharing her love for innovation in the workers' compensation space. Claire has earned her SCLA gold, as well as seven other industry designations. By the way, guys, Claire's bio was so long, and I feel so bad because I took out so much. Oh, but. that's totally great. I, I didn't write it. Our marketing department did, so. <laughs> degree from the University of Iowa, a master's of public administration, a specialist of educational leadership and business from Drake University, and a doctorate of education focused on organizational leadership in business from Grand Canyon University. She is also an adjunct professor at Drake University. Claire heads the Iowa chapter as an ambassador for the Alliance of Workers' Compensation and is president-elect for the International Association of Insurance Professionals, a member of Rising Insurance Star Executives, and she also mentors high school students through the National Leadership Academy. She also serves on the SFM Foundation and is a monthly contributor for our very own Just Begin magazine. So hi, Claire. Thank you for being with us today. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me, guys. And shout out that Just Begin magazine released on Monday. Yes. It's beautiful and fantastic and fabulous. And if you guys do not read it already, it is a beautiful magazine that will completely uplift your soul. 
I love it so much that I did become a contributor and it is my favorite thing when the first hits to see what everyone else has done. It is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen and it's fantastic. So I want to throw a plug in for that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Claire. So, but before we get started, this In Touch series is in partnership with New Life and Care Now. Um, so thank you so much to both New Life and Care Now. At this time, I'd like to give both of our partners a few minutes to chat. Um, we'll start with Care Now, Christopher and Jeannie. I see your boxes somewhere. Hi, guys. How are you? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. I'm doing good. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Very good. So I hope that you all are staying safe and healthy during these unprecedented times. My name is Chris Sosa. I am the occupational medicine sales manager for our Orlando and Charleston Care Now Urgent Care Clinics. And this is my colleague, Jeannie Jacobson, the occupational sales manager for Treasure Coast and Jacksonville. Hello, thank you, Chris. I'm very excited to be here today. We're elated to be here. In fact, it's not every day that you meet people who are just as excited about worker, workman's comp as you are and passionate <laughs> about it. So thank you, Claire, for your passion. Um, we're excited about that. And um, we're just you know, grateful for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about Care Now Urgent Care and um, especially to the leaders of you know, workers' compensation. Care Now Urgent Care has been in business for over 25 years. We do have over 150 clinics throughout the nation and we have nine clinics throughout the state of Florida. And as an urgent care platform for HCA, um, Hospital Corporation of America, some of you might know of us, we're one of the largest hospital systems in the U.S. And, um, you know, we, we do some really great things here in Florida specifically. We are open seven days a week uh, with our long extended hours. So that's good for you, too. And um, that's a little bit about the history of Care Now. At Care Now, we provide high quality occupational medicine services for employers, case managers, and risk managers. We pride ourselves on the level of communication that we encompass and provide in order to fulfill our duties to provide the continuity of care that's so imp important when it comes to workers' comp injuries. We provide an electronic medical record system that highlights your specific protocols that are detailed for your specific needs. We also provide access to our web-based portals, which allow for the same day access of medical records and work status reports so employees can return to work quickly. I'm sure you all have worked with urgent care centers that lack communication, which affects the quality of care that is being provided. Our goal is to ensure that we work at a superior level of service. And some of you may be thinking that's great that you have communication, but you may also be wondering if we know how to treat conservatively and centered around evidence-based medicine. And you should be asking those questions. Our providers are always treating on evidence-based medicine and understand the complexity of OSHA reportables, recordables. In fact, we have quarterly provider meetings that highlight this exact topic, ensuring that all providers are trained specifically in workers' comp and that they stay up to date with the new regulations. We all know that that is ever changing. Absolutely. Some of the services that we can provide include, but are not limited to, on-the-job injury care, of course, which is why we're here today, pre-surgical optimizations, drug screening, where we utilize our e-screen platform for fast reporting and physicals, and of course, rapid COVID testing and so, so much more. We've talked a little bit now about our services. We've touched on continuity of care and how important it is to us at Care Now. Um, I also wanted to touch on some of the safety measures that we are taking um, at the clinic level. Um, our lobbies are all socially distanced with floor markings throughout. Patients are asked to stay in their vehicles and we'll get a call when it's their time to see the medical provider. And we have also enhanced all of our cleaning procedures throughout all of our centers and all of our patients are offered masks and sanitizer upon entry to any one of our facilities. So as you can see, while the COVID-19 crisis sidelined many of our nation's businesses, Care Now Urgent Care has been moving faster than ever to find new ways to safely serve our patients and our business clients. All of our clinics offer enhanced safety precautions and all of our providers are extremely well versed within the workers comp space um, with quarterly training. Chris and I want to thank you so much for allowing us to join you during your training session 
And we hope that you found our presentation helpful and that you've learned a few things today about Care Now Urgent Care. Uh, moreover, we really hope that in today's presentation, I know as short as it is, um, that you can see that we're committing to returning patients to work with a healthy quality of life. If you're searching for an urgent care, come find the care that you can receive now at Care Now. And we wanna be there for your employers and your clients and um, where we can ensure that we're available for your needs if you need anything at all. We're gonna stay on till the end of the call. So if you have any questions about Care Now, you can reach out to us directly or ask us on um, the call today. Perfect, thank you guys. I appreciate it very much. Um, our next partner was New Life. We'll put her at the end. She'll come on and just say a few words. So um, she's not on right now, but we will, I'm sure she will be here. So. Um, and again, just want to remind you guys, remember to ask questions. Claire and Katie will be asking you guys questions. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Ladies, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So today I'm going to go ahead and screen share. So let me know when we are good to go. All right. Can everybody see my screen? OK. Uh one thing, if you guys would like, you could put on the top right, you'll see speaker view. And the speaker view will be the best for this presentation so that you could see both Claire and Katie. Sorry to interrupt, Claire. Go ahead. That's great. Logistics are awesome. So today, Katie, I have the, the privilege of presenting the history of workers' compensation with one of my dear friends in the industry and also business partners, Katie Hensley from Cottingham and Butler. So Katie speaks on the history of workers' compensation, and we feel that it's really imperative for the industry to understand where we've come from so we can better understand what we've done in the past that hasn't worked so well to be able to formulate a plan to continue to move forward and move that needle forward within the industry. Oops. All right, so... I love this dinosaur, by the way. This little dinosaur guy was my favorite. I think he's adorable. So we're gonna start out with, or we're gonna have our presentation is gonna be threefold. We're gonna talk about the foundational components of workers' compensation. Then we're gonna dive into the history of where we've come from and how we, what's transitioned over the time. And then what are we gonna do next? Where do we go from here? What does the current age of workers' compensation look like? And where do we think it needs to go moving forward? Like we said, um, this is gonna be very interactive and we do have questions for you. So to start out, we're going to cover the foundations of workers' compensation. With that, when you hear the words workers' compensation, what comes to mind? People getting hurt, getting injured. Thank you, Mike. There's gotta be more. What else yeah. comes to mind when you hear workers' compensation? Donna, I see you. Gotta unmute yourself though. I think um, just knowing what I know, uh, I consider the best care. I see Yvonne is typing in the chat, injuries, confusion of what to do, misunderstanding of the system. Mm -hmm. Lack of cooperation. Thank you, Tia. Paula says helplessness, a loss of control. Noreen Olson says a nightmare of confusion. Katie, from your perspective, what do you hear from employers? <laughs> so when I, I ask this um, with employers, I hear terms as it's a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's something they'll even say, it's something I don't like to talk about. <laughs> and so it, it really has a, um, a bad taste in, in folks mouth. And that's where I'm so passionate about education and where we've been. So back to the chat, we've got Yashika says collaboration, Carrie says litigation, Melissa says collaboration and teamwork, and Justin says opportunity. So in working with injured workers, I hear a lot on the negative side. I hear uh, lack of cooperation, my employer hates me, um, I've now become a leper, no one's listening to me. What about the media? For anyone that has watched TV lately, what's the media say about workers' compensation? What commercials do you guys see? It's all, it's all plaintiff-based. 
Yeah, Mike. So what are those commercials like? Are they, they're really, they're really nice about me as the insurance carrier, aren't they? Yeah. Right. They're super <laughs> negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They Makes are. us out to be like the enemy. Yeah. Absolutely. Money. If, if, if you've ever been in, sitting in um, the ICU um, or the oh. hospital and they have the TVs on, it's, I would tell you that, um, and being there, um, you know, many times, it seems like every firm has a commercial every five minutes, that it, every break. So you have families that are actually sitting there and it's not just for workers' comp, it's just the, the attorneys saying, you know, I, I, we do trucks, we do this, we do that. But workers' comp is the first thing is don't talk to your adjuster, you know, so. Yeah. Mari says confusion, Hollis says occupational safety measures, and Julie says an opportunity to help injured workers have a better experience in the claims process if we collaborate better together. So the interesting thing is when we look at workers' compensation yep. or even when we start talking about how, like if you're in workers' compensation, it's amazing on how many people automatically go to that negative connotations because of all of the information that pumps out into the media. And when we think about just when you look at the media as a whole, or you think about like all of the political ads that are out there or, you know, how our children are seeing how they see themselves right now from a beauty stance or a fitness stance or whatnot, the media sends a lot of messages to the through a plethora of channels that basically tell you like what Donna just said, don't talk to your adjuster, which is the most disheartening factor when we're trying to really move the industry forward. Like Julie said, as an opportunity to help injured workers have a better experience in the claims process. It's literally, you know, we're all here to try and collaborate and make the industry better. So that it was important to start with what do we hear? And then now we'll go into like the basics and the foundations. So what is workers' compensation? Obviously, workers' compensation is insurance, and it, insurance is to transfer a risk by contract. Um, just some other principles to highlight, principle of indemnification. So this is what I always find very interesting when we're talking, and Katie, please jump in here. When we are talking to people, like as the insurance carrier, it is my job to get people back into, to restore their livelihood. So when we look at that from a workers' compensation standpoint, it is my job as the insurance carrier to help restore that person into that body to back into being a, con a functional contributing member of society. Like that is what our goal is. And we do everything that we can to get them there. They need to meet us halfway. And so when we look at the principle of indemnification and you look at it across insurance lines, it is to return someone to the same position after a loss as prior to the loss. So when we look specifically to the definition of workers' compensation, and not necessarily injury, just compensation of an injured or compensation of a worker. It's giving something to a worker, one who performs labor for another for serve and then for services or rendered for injuries. And that was defined by Lloyd Hager. And then workers' compensation insurance, you know, this is where we're starting to talk about what are the benefits. Um, as we, you know, Donna, as you're talking about people sitting in the ICU there's a very difference of how workers' compensation insurance pays out versus how, you know, um, whatever I think of, like an auto loss. Auto. Thank you. Yes. How that pays out. And there tends to be that, you know, the muddiness of between like what a state mandated benefit is and then pain and suffering. And a lot of times with those different types, with whatever the media is pumping out in there, we then have to combat, okay, well, actually these are, these are state defined benefits. This is what we, we pay out for lost time and for injuries under the indemnity. And then we pay for medical treatment, but there is no pain and suffering and workers' compensation. And that gets people really frustrated. But when we think about the messages and then what the media puts out there, there's a lot of things that kind of stack up against us in this space. So now we're gonna go back, we're gonna take a flashback and figure out how we got here. So Katie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you. So what is history without really going back and, and looking at some black and white photos <laughs> and creations that today um, have given us so much opportunity, right? So I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with any of these photos on here, but we're looking at the first industrial revolution. So from 1760 to 1840-ish, what was going on then, right? Um, so 
prior to what you see on the screen, uh, there was it's a lot of it's a lot of human power, right? Um, it's it's taking you you got your horse, you got your hands, and you're getting to work. So you know, folks were really inventive. They came up with some creative ideas of using steam and using water to generate power, and that way we can have um, you know our the the three pictures. Um, so the first one you hear see here is uh, the invention of the steam engine, which led to locomotives, right? And what do locomotives lead to? Well, we're able to transfer goods. We have people building railroads. Uh, we have, we need coal. Um, so I say those, those topics right there in everyone's mind who has a history and comp is like, oh gosh, all the injuries on railroads and coal and mining and things along those lines, right? Then we take a look at um, the next ones that we have here, which is a cotton gin. Um, we also have a power loom and a spinning jenny. Um, all of those are items that have helped us with fabric, right? And um, taking away the, the the human power of having to go through and um, separate cotton, we've got um, we've got inventions to do so. So. Right here is, is a look at very important inventions that help lead us into the next phase, which we're going to talk about for the second industrial revolution. Claire, if I can have you click on that one. Got it. So those inventions led us into the second, which we're looking more in the 1817s, 1914s, right? So we then have a transfer into automobiles. Um, and if we're all thinking in our minds, the history of auto, uh, the assembly lines, and lots of dangerous um, things that occurred in regards to that. Looking in the middle here of moving from um, steel, or moving from iron to, or from steel to iron, sorry, <laughs> in regards to, um, you know, having cheaper abilities to build build bridges and to, um, to be able to build buildings. And right here at the light bulb. Um, so many days, um, folks would be working during the day, they would go outside and they would, that was how everybody um, worked their, um, their shifts if they weren't able to power with candles and um, lanterns. And so the, the shift of the industry to be able to work at night um, it was, was insane, right? And that actually added to a lot more hours that folks were working versus uh, the general during the day. So during the second industrial revolution, we have a whole bunch of items that are helping us to be able to have mass production, have luxuries that weren't affordable um, in the past. And what did that lead to? So we'll take a look here, Claire, if you don't mind. Well, some really poor working conditions, right? Um, so all of these ideas were great, but was anyone thinking about how this might impact uh, <laughs> the, the air, how this might impact injured workers? Um, no, there, there, was a, there was a focus on, on how, do we, how do we keep this going? How do we get bigger? And you know, there was a lot of sacrifices made. And if any of you can think of family members that you had that were um, you know, alive during these times, I, for me, my grandmother, she's, she didn't like to talk about this time, right? This was, this is a time where a lot of bad things happen. And as we go back and take a look at history and just these photos right here, I think all of us you know, are appalled, right? This is, this is what was going on. And most importantly, there was no protection for workers during this period which uh, for all of us and what we're here today, and we started off with talking about what does workers' compensation mean today? Well, it didn't exist back then. And um, we'll go on to what, what did exist. So if somebody was injured at work, they had the opportunity to, um, Claire, if we can go on to the civil, please. Um, so they had the ability to try to sue in civil courts. And so what would happen is employers, um, you know, there was, there was no mandates that they had to pay if somebody cut off their, their hand or, you know, they, they, they died. There was nothing that mandated that they had to pay anyone. And so what would happen is they would go in, they would, uh, they would um, you know, sue, and it would be through the tort system. And very rarely did injured workers prevail, okay? This did not happen often. They were often not paid. But what would occur is this would tie up employers, um, their time, their money, so many legal expenses, and they would, they would be losing workers. Um, so they weren't able to continue to, to produce. And so 
one of the, the areas and why the employees were not able to prevail is because they had what was called an unholy trinity of defenses. And I don't know if anyone on this team has ever heard of, of these phrases before, um, but I want you, as I'm going through them, I want you to think, how would this, how would this work today? How would this, how would this go in a situation? So contributory negligence. So if the injured worker had any, was in any way responsible for their injury, the employer in that civil suit would say, nope, not a chance, it's you, you, the, the courts would uh, deny, okay? So now today, right, we've got some states who have opened up, you know, if you're very consistent on your policies and procedures for, you know, for safety and writing up for violations, there are some states who have come in and said, listen, you know, we're going to knock 15% off of indemnity or, you know, certain, uh, a certain amount off of what your uh, potential settlement could be due to safety violations, but back then, if you had anything to do with your um, with your injury, not a chance. Okay, fellow servant rule. So think about this one: if a fellow employee had anything to do with your injury, then it was denied as well. Uh, not a chance in the civil suit. And so, if we think about today, how often you know we have employees working together, um, you know, working on a lift together, uh, someone's driving a forklift, you know, today and how those injuries occur. And back then, also, do you think that there was a lot of policies on drug and alcohol? You know, do, you, do these people were working hour, you know, 12 hour days, 14 hours days, people were tired. Accidents would happen um, from fellow servants and it wasn't purpose, right? It wasn't on purpose. Um, and so that was an opportunity where you would not be able to receive any, um, any payment from the civil suits. And, the worst um, that I think sticks with me is assumption of risk. So if you are going to go in and um, you know that your, your employer, it's, it's a area of high risk, you know what you're walking into, you've assumed that risk. Therefore, if you are injured, civil suits would shut you down as well. So these three items right here were named the whole unholy trinity of defenses. And it really made it very difficult for those pictures that I showed you early on with, um, with the inventions and our mass production and how you know we all have a lot of luxuries today. Well, they didn't have the ability um, to have any compensation um, for injuries that occurred. And there sure in the heck weren't any real you know, safety procedures or protocols going on back in those days either. All right, so hopefully I'm gonna ask, are there any questions? I'm gonna pause there for just a moment. It makes me think about like the horseplay defense that we have in workers' compensation at this point, or even like the intoxication defense that exists in a few states still at this point, and how that would have played in back then where it was non-existent, it would just have disqualified you from the system. It's kind mm -hmm. of fascinating. Yeah. Any, uh, and from an employer standpoint, I've, I've uh, presented this to many employers um, because they think this is important, you know, to understand the why we are here today. And Clara, I thank you for the, the horseplay, the intoxication, safety violations. Those are all things that we can talk about, but nothing compares to, to this. No, not at all. All right. Um, so I thought it would be helpful um, to take a look into uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. Um, from a show of hands, does any, is anyone familiar with this story? I'm going to use your uh, logos if you want to use, yeah, use your, your you can reactions up if anyone has heard of this. All right, Yvonne, we're going to turn it over to you and let you just roll with it here. Please, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the 1911 uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. So I just want to preface, this is um, prior to us having any uh, workers' compensation laws in, in place um, and regulations. <laughs> Yvonne thought you were really funny, Claire. Um, and so this building on the left here, um, it still stands today. Uh, the, it's a 10-story building and the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor all consisted of a, a factory um, where the where shirt waste, and if anyone doesn't know what a shirt waste is, it was the cute shirts they had back then that they could make, and it was affordable for, for everyone uh, to be able to wear. And so what had happened, and, and about, let's see here, it was about 4.40 on a Saturday, um, and it was uh, March 25th of 1911, uh, there was some flames that started in a bin on the eighth floor. 
Now, um, back then they still, there. you know, I've researched this a lot. It's believed that it was a cigarette that most likely started the fire. Um, there was no smoking allowed, of course, but someone, you know, most likely was. And, um, and the eighth floor um, started on fire. Um, well, they, the 10th floor um, in the ninth floor, they were just working along. Um, and I'll tell you right now, this became one of the most tragic moments in history. Uh, there were four elevators, only one was working. Um, there were stairwells. Um, but one of the stairwells had the doors locked uh, because the owners of the company were afraid that people would steal. And so they had the doors locked. Uh, the fire exits were flimsy and very narrow. Um, so to try to escape this fire, the eighth, ninth, and 10th floor, very, very difficult to do. Um, the owners who I have in that next picture there, uh, their names Isaac Harris and Max Blank, uh, they were able to escape through the roof and jump over to another building. Um, knowing that they had a door locked and um, that they were leaving their employees uh, there. And so what had happened is there were many bystanders who were witnessing this occur and several women um, actually jumped from the windows to try to save themselves, um, not, did not make it. And there were some very gruesome scenes as you can all imagine. Um, the, the, the end of the story is there were 146 people who died in this fire that day. Uh, and of them, most of the 123 were women and teenage girls. Uh, several of them were actually um, immigrants uh, that had recently come over. And uh, the situation is appalling. And for anyone who has not looked into the story, this actually leads into so many different angles, uh, not just workers' compensation history, but looking into you know, um, immigration policies, working hours, looking into um, you know, our safety standards, all of it, right? It, it leads in so many different angles and you can get lost in the story. Um, but there were some real strong folks that, that stood up and raised their hand after this occurred. Uh, Francis is, um, Perkins is who I have next to the gentleman here. Frances was a witness uh, to this and it changed her life forever. She became a true trailblazer, uh, first female uh, to be on, on the cabinet, uh, the US cabinet. Um, she was the, the first female uh, for the New York industrial um, to sit on that as well. And she helped uh, take, make serious change in regards to working hours for females, uh, working conditions, and just was a trailblazer. And so I thought it was very important to make sure we, we had Frances here. Got to give a shout out for Women's History Month. Yeah, yes, yes. So well done, Katie. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, over here to the right. Um, so there was there was a so people did try to stand up for themselves. They did try to pick it. They did try to say, hey, we're not being treated fairly. Um, 1909, there was actually an entire um, group of women from this shirtwaist factory that tried to pick it and say that they were having unfair working conditions and their hours and their wages. And um, these owners, it's alleged that they uh, hired, um, you know, police and thugs uh, to shut these women up and um, to make sure that they, they could continue making their profits and, and get people to work. And so, you know, there's some allegations in regards to when they had, you know, the, the, um, the newly, um, uh, the new immigrants that had come over, you know, that's why I, it's believed that this building, you know, was filled with so many immigrants versus, you know, women who had tried to stand up um, you know, in 1909. And so just as we look at this full encompassing, just how terrible, you know, all of this is. And so what happened after the fire, um, women rose up, uh, they picketed, they didn't care if, if the thugs were coming. Uh, this was a remarkable moment in history. And I highly recommend um, anyone who's a little passionate about this subject, uh, take a look into the story. And um, it's gonna take you on many different roads in regards to changes that occurred. Claire, anything you wanna add to that? No, I think it's absolutely fascinating, but I don't know if anyone else, like Yvonne, if you're familiar with the story, is there any other details that you would add into this? It's such a, it's so gripping. And I think that especially as we are in Women's History Month, I think it's really important to note what was going on and the treatment and the conditions and what was happening because this is our history and you can't move forward without knowing where you've come from. So Yvonne, anything you'd add? Yeah, no, I don't have anything to add other than, as you already pointed out, it's Women's History Month. And so it just makes me think of, um, I can't remember, you probably probably said it, Katie, but where did, where did this one happen? 
New York. New York. So mm -hmm. the only other thing I can think of is um, mentioning, and you might have this coming up, but um, it does it's not directly related to this, but Crystal Eastman is also really um, an interesting individual to mention, and it's, she's also a woman. So that's what makes me think of these things as these um, tragic events where it was um, usually women that rose to the top to get involved. And as you said, blaze the trails to make a difference. So absolutely. We don't and have her in here. So Yvonne, if you want to give a little plug, uh, we would take that. Oh my goodness. You're putting me. I am it's because you so talked. I know. You know <laughs> so Crystal. <laughs> East too. So I mean, I can totally go to her. Crystal Eastman is an individual. She was an attorney and I believe she was in Pennsylvania. The only reason I know about her is because there used to be an industry event that Joe Peduta and Peter Rumenier partnered on together and it was called the Crystal Conference. And so the history behind that was Crystal Eastman. So I'll find a link to Crystal Eastman and I'll share it in the chat. Also a very fascinating story. And like I said, a, um, she's a woman that was a trailblazer and has a lot to do. There's a lot of um, a, a lot of people attribute uh, the foundation of workers' compensation also starting with her and the work that she did. Uh, similar stories like this in Pennsylvania. So I'll share that. I'll go find some information and share it. Thank you so much, Yvonne. That's great. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention here, so I did tell you, so in New York, there was not a workers' compensation system at that time. In 1911, they did try, um, but it, it didn't get through until 1913. The women that died in this fire were the families, after finally going through all the civil suits and, and everything, they were paid $75 um, for, for the death, the families were. And um, what had also happened, and I apologize, I forgot to mention with these gentlemen, is there were stories um, of years prior that these gentlemen had started fires to their building um, at, before or after hours or before hours, not when people were there, to try to collect fire insurance um, on, on their building. So there was a lot of speculation when this happened, whether or not it, it was, you know, was it purposeful? Was it accidental? Um, it, everything that I found, it looked to be accidental at that time. But these gentlemen from um, the fire insurance were paid four hundred dollars, and they gave the, the the women seventy or the family seventy five, and so that just shows you how broken <laughs> this was back then as well. Um, so we'll go on. Um, we're going to talk about the the timeline uh, a little bit in regards to how um, the states ended up uh, bringing their, their systems today. So uh, in 1906, uh, this is, was kind of a start, right? They, they had um, enacted the Federal Employers Liability Act, and this helped protect the railroad workers. We mentioned railroad way back when, right? We were talking about 1800s and hey, you know, 1906, they're like, let's protect those guys. That, that's a good idea. Um, 1908, uh, federal employees compensation. This helped for federal um, civil uh, civilian employees who had um, some risky jobs. And so 1908, they're starting to think uh, a little differently. 1911, I don't know if anyone has handled Wisconsin workers compensation or familiar with it, but this does not surprise me at all. Um, the DWD, um, who oversees Wisconsin, they are still so involved today. Um, if you send them, a per you have to send them what the permanent partial disability is for an employee and what the doctor stated, and they can come back and say, no, no, that's not enough. You, you know, you need to pay a little bit more, and we're, we're very involved. So that doesn't surprise me. There's Wisconsin. Um, that same year in 1911, nine other states followed suit, okay? And so the last state in 1948 was Mississippi, okay? There was, a, if, and so I put in here that it's very important to know that it didn't take all the states until 1948 to get on board um, because as of 1921, we had all but six states. So, you know, a 10 year span, we had about 10 states get on board and then it took a bit um, to get the last uh, to move forward. So when we talk about workers' compensation today, which I think is important to note, is we are looking at, Claire, if I can have you. You got it. One. Perfect. Um, so workers' compensation today, I put a little blank for something fun here. Um, what type of insurance do we is workers' compensation? Anyone able to fill in the blank for me? Patricia, I saw your lips move, but you're on mute. Patricia, I can I can't. Nobody? No fault. No fault. I heard it. Thank you. Who was that? Mark. 
Hi, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Yes, you got it. No fault. We're going to toss you a prize. It's <laughs> pretend that you got it. <laughs> um, so yes, no fault insurance. Okay. So thinking back where we started, all right, those unholy trinity of defenses, uh, whether it's your employee's fault, you assume the risk um, and, and, and you, you contributed to your injury. No fault insurance is where we landed. Um, it made it much easier for all of the all of the evolution of all these ideas and um, how we can um, you know be sustainable and move forward with with production. We had to get a different system, and that's where no fault came in. Um, so I've got my cute little cat and dog down there. It's it's not a matter of who did it. Um, it's going to be covered as long as it's uh, you're in the course and scope of employment. It's considered a compensable injury, and um, that own holy trinity of defenses is no longer in existence. Now the employee still has the right to sue a third party um, should they be involved, such as you know another driver. Um, you know, a slip and fall in a parking lot of a convenience store, if that, if it all adds up, you know, that's an opportunity, but they cannot sue their employer. So this took them out of the civil suits, all that money tied up in defenses and tried to take away that nasty taste of what was going on um, back then. So I'm going to pause any questions or comments. It's quite a group. That's all right. We're, we are talking history. <laughs> I'm really jazzed about it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Yvonne, for putting that in the chat on Crystal Eastman. All right, Claire, we'll transition over to you, hon. All right. So my fate, I love the Hoover Dam, and especially for those of you that have been to the National Workers' Compensation and Disability Conference in Vegas. So one of my first times out there, decided to sneak away one morning. I'm sorry, I mean, I attended all of the sessions fully. Uh, we decided to sneak up early one morning and watch the sunrise from the Hoover Dam. The history of the Hoover Dam, I think, is totally encompassing of workers' compensation. So if you are not familiar with the history of workers' compensation it, as it pertains to the Hoover Dam, so let me set the scene for you. We have thousands of unrestrained workers. We are in the middle of the desert, and this is one of the hottest summers on record in 1931 when they are starting the construction for this. So now they are going to start building this dam that needs to come into place. So in order to create this, this construction site, they're building into a riverbed and they had to put in four diversion tunnels through the canyon walks. Two were gonna be on the Nevada side and two were gonna be on the Arizona side. So we are talking about tunnels that are 56 feet in diameter. So just, you know, a little bit taller than I am and a combination length of over 16,000 feet. So just try and put that into perspective. And so that we're looking at like more than three miles long which I probably couldn't even run three miles at this point. So they had to be sturdy enough to handle the Colorado River. And so we're looking at 850 cubic metrics of water a second. So pretty big in scope. If you have not been there, I'm just trying to give you a little bit of perspective for this. So they have to start by digging, they have to start by having tunnels. And so they start drilling. And in 1931, this is very slow and tedious work, as you can imagine. And remember, we've got all of these these workers without any any type of protection and we're out in the middle of the desert so we have a tight deadline as well because of course you're not going to be able to do you know get out throw in every type of complication that we can so frank crow comes up with this master solution with this tight deadline and the fact that a simple drill and hammer are not going to work for this solution so he gets these uh, 10 ton trucks that are brought in that each have about 50 men on board and they are going to run 24 to 30 drills per time or at a time. These trucks would be backed up against the walls of the tunnel and half of the wall would be able to be drilled at a time. So they have eight trucks, so nothing's gonna go wrong in this, of course. So you have eight of these trucks, you have 500 drills, and they were able to create these tunnels in record time. They ended up finishing 10 months ahead of schedule. So, you know, sounds great, right? Well, of course, you know, we always have to play the flip side in this. So again, Temperatures are gonna be crazy here. So we're talking about like 60 degrees Celsius. So we are hot. So not only is it hot for the summer, but now we're in an enclosed space. Now we're gonna talk about how the heat exhaustion. So not only do you have the drill residual dust that's flying up, but we end up having 14 men during phase one of the Hoover Dam die of heat exhaustion just in the construction of the tunnels. Hazards don't even stop there. 
So then when we look at the other workers that are hospitalized or killed during this process, we have a plethora that are, die of carbon monoxide poisoning because the tunnels obviously at this point don't have any type of ventilation system to support the steady stream of trucks that are going in and out. Many of these deaths were, were, were reported as a pneumonia outbreak according to the doctors at that time, but it is believed that this was misrepresented by the construction company to avoid paying death compensation because Nevada had enacted their Workers' Compensation Act of 1913. When they move on to phase two, all the tunnels are now completed, but now we're looking at the materials that have been extracted are put into place and we have water that has been drained from the construction site. The team was supposed to be high scalers that were going to work suspended from the top of the canyon. And I feel like as we talk about this, you can just automatically know that this is 19, early 1930s. We're, we're gonna be in a less than desirable safe from a safety, safety perspective. Falling objects were the number one cause of death during this phase on the dam site as a lot of the high scaffolders were often victims of the hazards that were coming down. To protect themselves from falling objects at this point, some of the high scalers took cloth hats and then tipped them, dipped them in tar. So you're taking just cloth dipped in tar to try and protect your head, allowing them to harden. When, we're, when the workers would wear this type of headgear and they were struck hard enough to inflict broken jaws, they would sustain no skull damage. So, you know, if you're just going to break your jaw, this is a better outcome than the alternative. So these were ended up, these tar-based cloth, hardened cloth hats were ended up being called hard-boiled hats and companies began to order these, encouraging like the first version of what we would call as like a hard, a certified hard hat. During phase three, we've got the excavations are now complete and now we are starting to pour the concrete. And this is what I get, this is where the story like really impacts, I guess me from a personal standpoint when we're looking at this beautiful structure is how many people are in the structure. So six, six million, 600,000 tons of concrete was used to build the Hoover Dam, kind of a lot. So when you will see a squared pattern, and I don't know if you can, you can see it kind of through the photo that's up on the screen, but the, there's a square pattern along the side of the Hoover Dam, and it's because it's made of a series of blocks of concrete for its structure. It is not made from a large pour. They attempted to pour out the Hoover Dam in one continuous piece, but in order to get the concrete to harden, it had to dry. And in, if they would have done it all at once, it would probably still be drying today. Well, of course, let's talk about the ingredients of concrete. Katie, what is in concrete? I'm just kidding. Um, so cement, aggregate, and water. And they, triple, they trigger a chemical reaction for anyone that is in the construction space or has had any encounter with um, any type of construction. The larger the pore, the longer it takes to harden. And there is a series of interlocking agents throughout this process. So we're looking at, we're trying to get the concrete to dry. We've got some harsh chemicals going on. So there was a, to try and get this to dry quicker, Frank Crow designs this elaborate network of overhead cables and pulleys to move across the concrete or to move across the Hoover Dam with buckets of concrete. So the buckets would then um, help. So they would do pour, they would pour in smaller amounts of concrete basically. So this is a, so they have this like system, this pulley system that's going across the Hoover Dam, and these buckets would hold 18 tons of concrete. They would lower them into place, pour into these more square type scenarios, and then continue on. Um, it probably would not pass a modern inspection today, but this is how they decided to continue to uh, basically pour the rest of the concrete to create the Hoover Dam. So the project completes in 1936 and it's two years quicker than the timeline was suggested. However, during construction, 112 people died. And we, you know, it wasn't uncommon back in the 19, early 1930s to have a high, fat high fatality rate along construction sites, but mainly because they didn't have access to the technology and they didn't have the understanding of all of the toxic fumes, the chemicals, et cetera. And of course, there really wasn't a lot of personal protective equipment. I mean, they were taking pieces of cloth and dipping them in tar to try and create some type of headwear, headgear to try and alleviate the impact from 
falling materials. So the other thing during this whole construction is some of the, like the employers that were involved in this weren't held accountable and for putting their injured workers into unsafe conditions. So while Nevada did have workers' compensation statute at this point, it was still, it would have been, it, it would not have fallen upon the employer at that point to have safe working conditions for their employees. So things to think about. It's not 1931 anymore and we have moved on and evolved, but I still really think it's, I don't know if you've ever been to the Hoover Dam, it is absolutely fascinating to look at what people were able to create back in the 1930s and just to think about what would have happened if you had sustained an injury while you were out there, so. Uh, Claire, one of the things too is that back then, right, where we have some really hard times going on and people oh, yeah, were great depression. lining up and begging to, to, to be a part of this and work and, you know, to look for money. And so kind of looking at flip side today of thinking about hard times, working conditions, um, you know, and it's up to us to, to stand up and make sure we're looking out for the best interest of employees and, um, and employers, you know, on both sides. Absolutely. So now we're transitioning, we're moving on. And so now how is workers' compensation evolving? And this is where we wanna go back to being interactive again. So the third industrial revolution starts to take place in the 1950s. And we start looking at more tech and automation and computers. And as we enter into the fourth industrial re revolution, which we're gonna call about the 2000s, which you can find late 19th century, late 19, around 1995-ish, so we're looking at a lot of different things that have impacted the workers' compensation space. And so we want to ask you guys, from your perspective, how do you think that we have continued to evolve workers' compensation even after, even post a third industrial revolution? And what are you seeing like over, let's draw out a little bit and look a little bit higher at themes of what are you seeing? Or how are you contributing to the evolution from your seat? find it hard to believe not anyone here is contributing to the evolution of workers' compensation. I think many times we don't know how much we've contributed until it's all over. I mean, we keep talking to employees and we're suggesting things for them to do. And very often the whole thing is concluded, the file is closed and we never get a chance to look back at the impact we've had on these workers. I had a man years ago who was Spanish speaking, was loading trucks, uh, injured his back. Um, it was not the most clear cut claim in the world. I pulled up early one day to see him and found he was hoeing his back, his front lawn. And I went, Johnny, mm -mm. And we went to the doctors and he was about to tell the doctor once again how bad his back was hurting. And I just looked at him and he told the doctor his back was fine. He was returned to work, but all along I had been talking to him about the fact that he really needed to get an education and do something else that he could not load this truck forever. About three years later, I was walking with my young children. It must have been more, it must have been four or five, through a store. And we got out to the parking lot and all of a sudden a man in a shirt and tie came running out after me. And he said, Miss Quinlan, Miss Quinlan. And I looked for a minute and I said, Johnny. He said, I always wanted to thank you. He said, after my file was closed, I went back to loading that truck and I thought about everything you said. He said, I went back to school and I got my two year degree. And this was the same employer, by the way. And he was now the manager of this store. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we always have to try our best, no matter what we perceive happening, because it's like our children or anything else. You know, you, you throw stuff out there and a lot of it sticks and we'll never know it. Patricia, I love that story. Thank you for sharing that because I think you depict a really, really important part of that you as a, one individual person 
can make a massive difference in this space by simply caring about that injured worker who you are working with. So I think that that is fantastic and I appreciate your story. All right, I see that Marion talked about the pandemic. Uh, yeah, we, the pandemic has definitely caused a accelerated shift in workers' compensation. And Avon, do you wanna do you want to share yours? Yvonne's only been in the industry since 1988, so she does not have any historical preference here. <laughs> well, I will just say, like I said in the chat, I just, I see that there's been, a, you know, a, a concerted effort to be more advocacy based and uh, pushing towards collaboration um, since I got involved. You know, when I got involved, it, um, you didn't hear about that. That just wasn't something that we talked about. And so I think that's a positive thing. I think there's still a long way to go along those lines. I always like to share um, a quote from a favorite person we all know and love in the industry. Um, Bill Zachary, his, one of his famous lines is do the right thing and everybody wins. So I just don't know why that is such a difficult um, concept for everybody to grasp. No, and you know, when Katie told the story from, you know, from 1911, and we hear about, you know, the owners of the organization, as much as that is painstaking to hear and to hear about all the people that died, there are people that exist like that, that are still here today. And we're over a hundred oh, yeah. years after that. Yes. And so while those stories are absolutely earth shattering and terrible, and they evoke emotion within all of us, it's people that would still behave in the exact same manner that are here. Oh, yeah. It's just disheartening. Mike. I love what you shared. Yeah. Let's talk OD about it. Well, ODG guidelines. I mean, uh, when there's specific injuries that the um, physician, treating physicians, when they script for PT, they try to overscript, say, 12 physical therapy for a rotator cuff tear when actually you only need six. So ODG guidelines really helps us get that injured worker uh, to uh, MMI a lot more cost effectively and uh, quicker. So I'm, I'm a big believer in ODG guidelines. We utilize it every day. And I think what's helpful about ODG is that it's not specific to personal health or work comp. You know, it's taking mm -hmm. that collaboration of both, which is right. actually, right. Mike, I swear, are you paying attention? Because oh. work comp versus personal health. Oh, there you go. You know, so and Katie works with employers on a regular basis and I get to work on them in a different capacity. But when you're looking at an entire program and we're looking at the health and well-being of people's employees. So, you know, you've hired these people to come work for you because you obviously have some reasoning that you want them to be a part of your group. So then it really comes down to how are you going to package benefits? And Katie, I don't know if you want to give a couple perspectives from your seat and because you're more on the how do we package and I'm more how do we handle Yes, yeah, so I love the, the bucket uh, phrase here. Uh, that is absolutely a um, term I use on a regular basis. Which bucket does this fall under in regards to personal health or um, workers' compensation? And so we're really fortunate that we have a benefits team too. So we partner with them a lot in regards to conversations about uh, our clients, if they're offering short-term disability, our clients following the correct FMLA, um, you know, ADA guidelines. So we're, we're looking at it from a holistic, bigger picture than just that work comp claim because there's so many other pieces that, that impact. Um, and I think it's all about education for the employers to try to get out some of that bad taste, those, the necessary evil, um, they don't even want to talk about it. Um, and, and understand that like, like, um, was quoted, you know, just do the right thing and, and all will fall into place. And it's very interesting when we're working with employers and I don't think it matters which side you're on. We have no problem paying a medical bill for somebody's personal health. If somebody goes and does something and we pay for, okay, let's say, Katie, let's say you're playing softball. This is my, I always use the softball industry. I got to find a new example. But Katie goes and injures her shoulder and it goes into personal health and you don't hear an employer squawk, but we put it under workers' compensation. And suddenly it's like, well, why would you pay that? Okay, well, you don't, we don't do that on the personal health side. So it's very interesting when we talk about the bad taste when really it's going to fall under one of two buckets. It's just that one thing is going to be mandated by the state and the other is more just what is your plethora of services. So when we look at programming and how we effectively communicate the programming of workers' compensation, it really looks at the entire health of your employee. And so one of the good one of the examples that I can say from my seat is that we were working with an automotive group 
and they had they were trying to increase their benefits for their employees and so they had purchased they had looked at their um their whole scope of kind of insurance offerings of their suite of services they were going to be providing to their workers and so they they came to us and said okay so let it help us understand what you're seeing from the work comp side and so we've been seeing a lot of eye injuries and they said, well, we already offer, we already offer goggles for people and whatnot. And we, so then we talked about like, how easy are they to wear with glasses? And you start looking down into the, why are we continuing to have these eye injuries? So they started to buy, so we looked at, sorry, they had already been purchasing vision insurance, but the use was at two to 3%. So then we start working, let's work with work comp and let's work with personal health together. If you guys are already paying for these benefits for your employees, how are you marketing it? How are you, are you marketing that to them? to get them to utilize this, these services. So they started a different type of marketing program about, hey, we care about you when you are not here. In order to make sure that you are able to live your best life when you are not working in our, with or working for us, we wanna make sure that you're taking advantage of your vision benefits and that you're able to get, if you would like to get goggles that actually have the prescription in there so you don't have to wear both. And it's all about how you phrase it because like we talked about, it's gonna come out of one bucket or the other. So how do you utilize your programming and they utilize the insurance that you're already paying for to, or towards your employees as a better outcome for not only how you care about them as a human being, but also by doing the right thing and doing this on the front end, you end up having less claims on the flip side. So it's always interesting to me when we talk about like doing the right thing, it saves money. And I don't understand why people just don't buy into this. So it's very important that we illustrate the difference between which bucket does it fall under and how really focusing on the well being of the employee as a whole is a really different concept that has not always been focused on because again, we will absolutely talk about how it's easy to pay a personal health claim for whatever happens outside, but we put work comp on it and then suddenly there's like this advent advantageous relationship with the whole concept. Mike. I have recently shared with clients, employers, comorbidities. And they appreciated that because once they're aware of comorbidities, their personal health issues, they're able to help them because if they do get injured, if they're already having these co uh, comorbidities, it takes them longer to come back to work, right? So, so we have employers actually asking us, hey, share with us comorbidities that we may not be aware of so that we can help our, our employees be healthier. So, so that we see it. <laughs> I'm sure. sorry to interrupt you, Mike. I appreciate that. Paula Bowers is a registered nurse that's on our team and um, she had to drop off, but I love what you said there because one of the things that she brought to the table when she joined our team was, hey, um, if smoking is what's causing this person to not be able to have their fusion surgery or it's, it's, it's delaying the work comp, maybe right. the smoking cessation program that's tied right. into their benefits that we can tap into. And so starting to really bridge those conversations is so important. Absolutely. I mean, pre-diabetes, you know, the, the osteomyelitis, all those things that could cause problems for any kind of surgeries. Um, they wanted, I, I, I share that with them. They're like, oh my gosh, we did not know they had high blood pressure or they were pre-diabetic. And they're like, okay. So they're trying to help their employees. And I think that's a good thing, right? It, it saves money too, uh, long-term. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And when, when we look at like the different method, the different methods that we will treat somebody from like a personal health standpoint versus a worker's compensation, we tend to be a little bit, I feel, and again, I'm going to speak from my own scope of control that we are less, we are less risk we're more risk adverse in the worker's compensation space to try new things. And I think that when we look, especially at like how we medicate human beings. So I'm going to kick this over to Mark Pugh, who is on our call and ask Mark for his opinion on this. When we look at personal health and workers' compensation, where we've come from to where we're going and what we look at, because Mark is known as the professor of pharmacy. So Mark, do you have any thoughts on how this plays into the whole big scope of where we've come from to where we're going? Well, I, I agree with all the comments in regards to the, the, the bigger picture and the view on holistic health when it comes to work comp. Um, I think the smarter payers are paying attention to the bigger picture, like for example, social determinants of health. Uh, the fact that they don't have a car is not a work comp problem, but the fact that they don't have a car means that they're not gonna be able to go to their PT visits and be compliant with their ongoing treatment, which is going to um, increase 
uh, the duration of their disability and probably retard their ability to return to work. And so there, I think smarter payers are understanding the, the physical uh, medical comorbidities, um, the psychosocial comorbidities, um, you know, how pain has, how pain management has been modeled to them in the past is going to influence how they themselves handle resilience and handle pain management. And again, not, nothing of that has anything to do with the ACL tear that they, they uh, incurred at work. But when you start seeing uh, issues, um, that's why predictive analytics is so important because you need to understand those red flags those yellow flags, those black flags that are associated with treatment going south, that treatment uh, is gearing towards more suboptimal outcome. ODG has a bunch of stuff that that's loaded in uh, to their platform. Um, a variety of different insurance companies and TPAs um, have this ba baked into their claim systems. But the, the key is to identify those particular confounding issues that's going to potentially uh, negatively impact the return to work and the duration of disability, recognizing them early um, and getting thrown the kitchen sink at it, whether it's telephonic or field case management, whether it's additional service providers, whether it's uh, being more active listening from a claims adjuster and asking less yes or no questions and asking questions that elicit a conversation that helps you get a feel for where they're coming from. Um, I all learning that just the biomedical model that work comp has hung their hat on for many, many years is largely insufficient um, for those really catastrophic, either physically catastrophic or the ones that become financially catastrophic over time. I love that. That goes into my next, but well, we've got media up there, but science, like the whole science about workers' compensation, it's no longer simply the way that we have taken the approach of moving forward in the industry is it's not specific to, all right, so Katie injures her shoulder at softball. It's, or sorry, work injury. So Katie injures her shoulder at work. It's not just about the shoulder injury anymore. It's also looking at that whole, the whole biopsychosocial model. So it's not just the shoulder injury, but what does that mean for when Katie's at home with her son? And I'm using this because you already talked about your son. So no, that I would not do that without your permission. But so Katie's at home with her son and now she can't, she can't, let's say he's three years old and she can't lift him anymore, or she's having a hard time, you know, trying to give him a bath, like those basic human needs that we don't think about. Because when we think about a work injury, we always assume that it's, you know, the eight hours of the work that's being missed when really the work injury is impacting 24 hours of somebody's daily life. And so as we've taken that new approach, I, want, I don't want to call it a new approach, but as we've taken a more holistic approach to understanding the mental components that also go in to a worker's injury, a worker's compensation injury, we are able to better understand what mitigating factors that we're going to need to help resolve. And I love how you highlighted the social determinants of health, Mark, because you're right. It's not somebody, it's not workers' compensation's fault that they don't have transportation to get to and from something, but the more that we can increase increase awareness around these, these factors that truly do impact, and we start to think outside the box on how we take care of this person to get them back into that indemnification part that we talked about at the beginning of really getting them back into being a functional contributing member of society, that is where we, we are going to be continuing to drive the effective change. And then when we look Look at technology. Technology continues to always be on the forefront of everyone's mind. And I, I love, I believe it was Marina, Melissa, maybe, no, Marion talked about um, the pandemic has changed everything. So a lot of companies were utilizing like the nurse tri triage and the physician triage from a stance of telemedicine. And now with the pandemic coming through, telemedicine became a very real topic very quickly that accelerated. And then we've seen companies that are have started to do physical therapy through that type of manner. And it really accelerated the amount of how much technology was going to be put into the medical field in a very drastic component. So I love that you highlighted that as well. So thank you. Anything else that anyone wants to add in this topic? We'll keep looking. No, it's just funny to, to step back and look at where we started this presentation to now the topics we talk about, right? So it's so it's so helpful just to see where we came from. So we talk about, all right, so like Katie just said, we've just looked at this big landscape. And so now we're looking at where do we go from here? So where do we go? You're going to get off this webinar with us today. And where do we go from here? So I'd like those of you who want to be brave souls today to tell us that there's one thing that you can do when you get off this webinar to effectively move that needle forward in workers' compensation. And I love that Patricia shared her story because I think she really does 
give it that really back to the bare bones basics of what we do in workers' compensation, especially when we look at how the whole purpose is to indemnify. So I'm looking for some volunteers to share. So Mike, you're off mute. You're the first person I get to see. Well, I think the number one concern I hear across the country is the fracture of communication between the injured worker and the uh, employer. We need to communicate. We need to educate and communicate the injured worker as much as possible because they're confused. They don't know what's next. But I think for what I do and, and where I'm positioned in the industry is really strive to communicate with the risk managers of the employer, the injured worker, so that everybody understands what the next step is for him or her to get them back to work. But I think communication is really a key. And I'm hearing that it's fractured not only because of the pandemic, but just in general, mm -hmm. nobody, they, they just want a clear understanding of what's happening right now. But I Which think- Which is super funny when we have all of this technology to connect us, we are yep. on that fractured spectrum, yep. especially yep. in this space. And, you know, I love when we get to talk to attorneys and ask, all right, so help me understand, like, what are you hearing from your injured workers? Number one, communication. Mm -hmm. Whether it's not returning phone calls or it's, they did not help me understand this process. Mm -hmm. You know, just- yeah, we got to rethink the communication model in workers' compensation, yeah. which we will be talking about in the next couple of weeks in the industry as well. Um, I agree with that. I think there's a, an expansion to it. It's not, the, and sometimes I think people get confused. It's not just the communication, it's the clarity yes. of the communication. It's um, you know, going through nursing school, one of the things they teach you is you educate everybody on a sixth grade level, right? Not talk down to them, but don't think everybody knows the big words that you know. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes what happened, I just got a phone call today and, and the attorney was like, oh my God, we're so excited. The patient's following commands. And I'm like, not, not when I saw her, you know, so it's, and, and, you know, the difference between tracking and following commands or respond, you know, a reflective. And so it's, it's having that real conversation and, and making sure that they understand what you're communicating, not just the communication. So I, I think it goes a, a little bit deeper, um, but there is a fracture in the communication and, and um, you know, the families here, you know, they say, what do they, you hear, you understand 20% of what you're hearing. So, <laughs> you know, it's, and that's where it becomes um, difficult. So, you know, my, my goal is to make sure that what I'm communicating is very clear. I love that. It's gotta be consumable. We have to be able to create consumable information and then check for understanding. We've got to check for understanding that people understand the process. This is such a, it's such a tedious, really convoluted process that is just, it's kind of funny that over the years that we haven't tried to make this much simpler just in general when really it's, it's not that hard. So very interesting. So when, with we, the, well, when we go out in the short term here, I think we can underestimate the impact of the pandemic and the malaise that is underlying so much of what is going on. And going to what Melissa said, it's being very clear as to not only what we say, but what we hear and then getting feedback on it. It's like that thing we, we all see on Facebook or wherever. Uh, if you ever need me, please be aware that you can call me at any time. That's just half of the equation. The other half of the equation is when somebody says something, don't be afraid to drill down on it and see where it's coming from because it may impact upon everything that you're seeing and doing. It's laying out there. I mean, I see it day by day. We're in 17 states and I see it in nurses, I see it in employers and I see it in our injured workers. It's not just fear of going back to work, but it's the malaise of everything that's happened, um, be it on the TV, be it their families or everything that's sad that's gone on around them. Thank you for sharing that. It's a very good perspective. Uh, one of the things, as we just mentioned the pandemic, I know we're over time here, um, but is hearing from people who are boots on the ground working, right? So listening, like you said, Patricia, listening to those stories. My sister is a CNA um, at a, a nursing home uh, with a dementia unit, and she's got a 12th grade education. And I can tell you this past year has just been 
insane, right? Every, every day, something is changing. She's, she's scared. She gets concerned, you know, and, um, and just having someone to talk to Patricia. So thank you for, for that statement. And it's so important to listen to the boots on the ground and, and have that to help us trailblaze what we're trying to change. Absolutely. And Melissa talked about like just the communication models and workers compensation and what we do do and what we don't. And, you know, as this is all about coffee and collaboration and whatnot, like I am hosting a conversation about the communication models coming up on March 16th with the transition. So communication models is exactly what we're going to cover. So Melissa, love where your head's at. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for thinking about that as well. So these conversations will continue. I do think that we we are going to drive moving forward in the workers' compensation industry. I know that this intense mentoring series, everything that we're trying to do is really to try and build a bigger community of like-minded individuals that want to effectively change the workers' compensation industry so that it's better for one another. Because we all coming together can make this and drive this effective change. It just starts with one person. So I want to give a massive shout out to the InTouch team and Mari and Annalise, because you guys are fantastic of bringing us together to have these mentoring series and where it's not just another webinar, but it's actually like, let's collaborate. Let's talk about stuff. Like I love Patricia's stories and I would have gotten to hear those today. And they really drive home exactly what we're trying to do. And Melissa for touching on the communication models and whatnot. So with that, I guess we will open it up for any other questions and sorry that we went over today, guys, but you know, the history of work comp, some of us get super, super, super exciting about this stuff. Who would have known? I know. <laughs> Any questions before we wrap up? All right. I wanna say thank you to Claire and Katie. Thank you so much for doing the presentation. It was very informative and I learned a lot. <laughs> so thank you. And you're welcome here anytime. Yes. Very informative. I'll definitely be bringing her back actually, both of them um, for our next mentor series sometime in April. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I know that both Claire and Katie are going to come back sometime. So stay tuned. You guys can sign up for all of the um, events at the on the InTouch platform. So if you haven't signed up, please do so. It's at www.intouchwc.com. The platform is growing every day. We have over 800 members. And I just want to point out, we do have a lot of our leaders on this call Um we have Claire, Shannon, Tendeka, Tia. So we have so many. If you guys haven't joined the chapter, make sure you do so. Um, you know, there we're doing so many exciting things throughout the entire month. That we're going to be doing a lot of giveaways, um, and you can only sign up if you are in in touch. So if you guys have any questions, if you have any questions for Chris and Jeannie, if they're still on this call, feel free to shoot them a message. Again, thank you to Claire. Thank you to Katie. You yeah. ladies are wonderful and we can't wait for the next one. So thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Nice to meet everyone. Yes. Have a great day, you guys. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Bye. Take care. I'm just staying on to see if everyone pops off and we can say hi. <laughs> To have a few. <laughs> I want to thank you ladies so much. That was informative and that was um, so nice to be a part of this. And thank you for letting us be sponsors. Please consider us again in the future if you ever need anything. And you have our contact. So if there's anything that um, folks need, you just let us know. Perfect. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Claire, I'll contact you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so please much. do. Okay.